And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. All right, folks, I thought I would take a break from reviewing new games all the time. And I get a lot of requests to take a look at older games. And I, I don't have the time to do that as much as I'd like to. But today, I want to take a look at Twilight Imperium. One of the hottest games of 2011 is Eclipse, which is kind of a Euro game type style of Twilight Imperium. And so after we played it, it was, it's a great, great game. Uh, and then we said, well, you know what? We haven't played Twilight Imperium for a while, so let's pull it out and try out the game again. And it is amazing. Twilight Imperium is a space epic game. And I mean epic, epic. When it came out, it came out with the intent of there would never be any expansions. This was done. This was everything in a box. It's the third uh, incarnation of the game. It was huge. And yet, two expansions have come out anyway and made it even more epic, even more expansive. I mean, everything that you could possibly want in a space game really is inside this box. Does that mean everything inside the box is good? No. And so what I'm going to do over this video and the next videos is talk about the different things that came in the Hello. base game and that came in the expansions. And I'm going to tell you the things I like and don't like, but I'll tell you right now, I love the game. I think the game is fantastic. And if there's only one, my one biggest problem with the game is the fact that it's simply a very long game. There are players out there who say they can play it in three or four hours. And that has not yet not happened to me, although I have had a game end in six hours. But it is an experience. It is absolutely amazing. Let's take a look at it. Of course, with this many pieces, component drop would be kind of excessive, right? <laughs> not at the dice tower. As you can see by this point, there is a ton of stuff that comes in this game, and I'm not going to separate it all out completely. In this video, I'm going to be showing you things from the original game, although little bits of expansion pieces may slip in. What can I do about that? I'll talk about them in the next video. But at the beginning of the game, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be choosing an alien race, although you can hand them out randomly, but where's the fun in that? And in this game, there's actually 10 different alien races. Now, each alien race, if you look on the flip side, has a very long history of how that alien race goes. And that's really cool. And I, I think that adds a lot to the theme of the game. Plus, the alien races really do look quite different from each other and actually have quite different special abilities. Now, it looks like there's a lot of information on this card, but really everything here is kind of just, you know, how to play the game. The game rounds and how much all the units cost and what have you. Up here is a special ability of the character. Here it tells you what starting units and what starting technologies you get. And then over here is where you're going to keep, you have your command pool and trade goods. And I'm going to come back and talk about that later on. And I'll actually talk about the races a little bit later on. But each player is also going to get a pile of pieces in one of six colors. We got black, green, blue, yellow, purple, and red. Okay, so there's a lot of pieces that come in this game. We'll take a closer look at those pieces later on. Then, when you pick your race, you're going to get a whole pile of pieces that are the symbol and color of your race. And when you pick your race, you're also going to get the color uh, technology cards that match the color of the pieces that you chose. So you have, for example, I can, I'm here. I'm going to be the Hassan Empire, or the Emirates of Hassan, I should say. And I have the pieces that match them. And then I've taken red for my color. And so that's what I start the game with. The game comes with a whole pile of hexes that players will be using. They will always use Mechatol Rex, which is placed in the middle of the board. It's a giant planet where the Empire used to flourish and be wonderful. But you have all sorts of other hexes that can be in the game, and these hexes will have either nothing on them or different planets on them. Now, each planet in the game, as you can see, has two numbers. has a name and two numbers, and the first number is how much production that planet produces, or the money, in essence. And then you have the uh, influence of that, or how many votes that, that can produce in an election. So different planets will have different numbers, and some planets will have this symbol here, or a symbol that's very similar to it, but of a different color. 
like for example this blue one here, and that planet will give you a bonus when you're researching technology that matches that color. So different planets are going to have different special abilities as the game progresses, but there's also empty space, and then there's also going to be some things out there which are just cool, like a nebula, which you can fly through, but when you get into it you have to stop, and if you defend in a nebula, or you have the supernova, which, you know, really, nobody can fly through because, well, it's a supernova. Come on now. Asteroid fields, which you need a certain technology to fly through. And these are in the game. And there's also wormholes. So, if sees, for example, this is wormhole B. If there's another wormhole B on the board, it's as if these two hexes are adjacent to each other. So, there's kind of a complicated setup. Not complicated, but, I mean, an involved setup where everyone's going to get some of these. And you're going to start with Mechatol Rex and then build your way around it. So you get to the outside ring, and then depending on how many players there are, each player also is going to get a one of these, and they're going to stick it into the grid. For for example, here's the Emirates of Hassan. These are the three starting planets that I start with. And so you can see here I have Aritz and Comdorn and Hercant, and I like to pronounce all these so that the people who are super fans of this can uh, write in and say how incorrect my pronunciation is. And when I put this in front of me, each player is also going to get a card that matches these. And the card has a little bit of background flavor and a picture of the name, but mostly just has the information that's on the planets there in front of you so that you can have these in front of yourself for when you're going to use them. Every planet in the game has a card. I keep mine in alphabetical order. So whenever I need to find a different planet, and so let's say I want to find Theba, there's Theba, and I just pull it out of the deck and put it in front of me. When you capture a planet, You'll put them face down, but as the game progresses, you will keep them face up in front of you. During turns, you're going to be using these planets, exhausting them. I usually turn them face over, or you can tap them or whatever, to use either the, the resources or the influence. You'll use this usually in votes, although in other instances you can use it, and you use this to build more units in your campaign. Now, the goal of this game is not necessarily to destroy everyone else on the board. But you can do that, but there's a different goal. Here we have a victory point track involved in the game, and there's different ways to get victory points as the game progresses, but most of the ways that people are going to get victory points is by completing objectives. Everybody at the beginning of the game is going to get secret objectives that they can try to complete, and these secret objectives are always worth two victory points. Like, for example, here, you control Mechatol Rex, and you have a space docks and at least six ground forces there. Here, you control at least six planets with a technology specialty. Here you control all the planets in another player's home system. Now, if there's one problem, and here's a minor problem I have with the game, is that these don't really seem even. The controlling all the planets in another player's home system, if you're not a very warlike race, that's a very difficult thing to do. But no matter, because everybody has a chance to go for public objectives. You're going to place these in a pile where you'll have some stage ones, top of stage twos, and as the turns go by, you're going to put these out in front, and anyone has a chance to do this. So you put this out here above, the victory point track, and when I can accomplish that each turn, I'll put one of my flags there to show that I've accomplished it. For example, I control the planets needed to have at least one of each of the three technology specialties. Or, I control five planets outside my home system. Or, I have three technological advances of the same color. Or, I can spend ten influence right now. Or, all three of my space docks are on a board. Or, I have five technological advances. The, the phase two ones are usually two, these are usually one victory points, as then you get to two victory points. I control 10 planets outside my home system. Some will even win you the game. I control the planets in the home systems of two other players. But eventually, Imperium Rex is going to show up. And when this card shows up, whoever, as soon as it shows up, the game's over. And whoever has the most points is the winner. Other than that, the first person to 10 points wins. Or if you're feeling kind of brutal, you can go all the way up to 12 or even 14 points for a longer game. Here we have where the game really really shines. Here's one of the cool aspects of this game. Christian Peterson, the designer, uh, showed how he got this progression from Euro games, but this came into Twilight Imperium, and at the beginning of the game, someone's going to have this speaker token, and this token's going to change as the game progresses, but at the beginning of each round of the game, each player involved is going to choose one of these, well, two of them if you're in a three to four player game, and you will take that and place it in front of you. It's going to give you a special ability as the round progresses. Any one of these that's not chosen is going to have a bonus token put on it, so that in future rounds, it will be more tempting to choose. Now, each of these has something special. We're going to come back and talk about them later on, but it is a really cool feature of the game. Hang on. Now, let's talk about one of the most, the single most 
innovative, cool features of Twilight Imperium 3. And that is down here in the command pool or the strategy allocation section. You have these command tokens and each turn you're going to get two more of these tokens. But this is what you start the game with. And you can put these tokens in any of these three different locations. The tokens have two sides. You flip them to this side so that you don't get them mixed up. The one in the middle is the easiest. It's the fleet supply. Basically, when you have your large ships, your cruisers, your dreadnoughts, and so on, this is the, the biggest amount you can have in any region on the board. So, you start with three. The biggest your fleet can be is three. You can put more there to increase it, but you might be losing some of these tokens from other spots. Like I said, you'll get more tokens, but you're also spending tokens. The tokens down here in your command pool, these are tokens that you will use to build more units and to move units on the board. So the more tokens you have over here, the more uh, tactical moves you have on the board. And then a strategy allocation, that comes back to these over here, and we'll talk about these in just a second, but you'll need to use these for special abilities. Now, as a, once everyone has done picked, picking your things, a turn starts, starting with the player who picked number one, and then going to the player who picked number two, and so on and so forth. So again, picking these also determines your order and how the game progresses. When you pick these, usually, not with number one, but usually, the person who puts it down will get to do whatever the top says. Everybody else can do the bottom, but they have to pay one of their strategy allocation tokens to do so. And you see you only start with two. So you have to determine which of these secondary abilities are best for you. So let's go over these real quick, what they do. Initiative. Whoever takes this one gets the speaker token. Okay, the speaker token means you get to pick first next time. So that's a big deal. And you're not allowed to pick this one twice in a row. And during the action phase, you don't have to pay these strategy allocations to take the secondary abilities of everyone else's. Well, that's a really big deal. Okay. Now, number two, diplomacy. If you take this, the person who takes it can pick another opponent, and that opponent basically can't attack you at all this turn. Everybody else can refresh their, two of their exhausted cards so you can turn them back over so that you can use them again over the course of the game. This is really good when you have a very warlike neighbor. Political. Oh, we're going to come back to political. Logistics. Here you get four command counters, and you can add them to your area anywhere you want. And everybody else with the secondary ability can spend influence to get more command counters. In the trade, everybody gets three trade goods. Or you get three trade goods, I'm sorry. And you put them here. Now, trade goods can be turned in any time for influence or resources. So that's very useful, and you can save them from turn to turn. And they have other uses as the game progresses. And then other, you will be able to get trade goods from any active trade agreement that you might have. Everybody starts with different trade agreements. So, for example, here I have two trade agreements versus, that are worth three trade goods. And that the reason I have that is because this race here is the trading race. And I can give this card to somebody else if they give me one of their cards. And every time someone plays this trade token, we're going to both get that many resources of the trade. Unfortunately, the person who put down this card, who played this card, they have to approve. So you have to talk them into it or pay them into it somehow. A lot of fun, and this is where a lot of negotiation comes in. The person who takes this can also cancel everybody's trade agreements if they don't like what's going on. The secondary ability is you can receive trade goods for your agreements, but you got to pay for it. So not everyone's going to get them. The guy who gets the card gets them from his trade. Everybody else has to pay one of these to get their trade goods. Warfare. If you want to fight, basically this lets you move twice on the board. And everybody else can move a few units around the board if they use strategy allocation. Technology gives you a free technology, and everybody else can pay to get a technology. Imperial gives, lets you draw the next card from the objective deck. Remember we talked about the objective decks. This is how the new cards will come out when this card is played. And then the person who takes this card gets two victory points. Uh, and then everyone else can build units in a system where they've already built units. Now, this is one of the kind of controversial points of this game because two points is a lot you realize you only need 10 to win so this card will likely be taken every round and some people have said that whoever chooses first takes this card and whoever chooses second takes the initiative so that next turn they can choose this card and I can see that it's never actually happened in any of my game groups because I have bloodthirsty game groups and they don't care so much about these they actually want to kill things uh, but I can see that being a problem however it was uh, fixed I guess would be the word for it in, in, in an expansion but that's how these work and you'll take these. Now, 
when you're on the board, the way the command tokens work is, let's say you have some ships here in this location, and you want to move to this spot. You will take a command counter from your command pool, put it in the spot that you're moving to, and move the ships there, as long as they have the movement to get there, and so on and so forth. Uh, if there's other ships there from another color, then you attack. And I'm not going to talk a lot about attacking, but although it is a big part of this game, but you're always going to use 10-sided dice in this game. And each unit will have a certain number that it needs to hit higher than. Okay, I'll mention a little bit of combat later. But once this token here, this command token, is in this hex, you can no longer move these units that are at that hex. If you happen to have a space dock at your hex, and almost everybody will have a space dock at the beginning of the game on their starting planet, and you can build more of them, then you can produce resources, or more units. There's some restrictions. So let's say I build a couple more units here, but again, because I put a command token there, I can't play move these guys again this round. At the end of the round, during the status phase, these tokens will come out, so I'll be able to use them again each turn. It's a very nice movement system, and it allows people to move all over the board at different times. You don't move all your pieces. You just move as many as you want to a specific hex each turn. And so that's what command tokens can be used for, basically to move ships to a spot or to produce and or to produce resources from one of these. Every player has these units that they can build as the game progresses. You have space docks where you can build more space. You have infantry, uh, which kind of a little dull there with the flag, but hey, they're infantry. And you, those are basically just used to conquer different planets. You have fighters. Then you have PDS, Planetary Defense Systems, which can shoot both at invading units when they're coming down to the planet and at ships as they go through. You have uh, destroyers, which are excellent against fighters. You have cruisers, which are kind of your normal ship, but they can move pretty fast. You have your aircraft carriers. Oh, I'm sorry. Your, <laughs> your carriers. Uh, but they can carry PDS, they can carry fighters, and they can carry infantry. Infantry and PDS, they just carry for transport, but fighters they carry... Because fighters can't fly around by themselves, they need a carrier to move with them. Then you have the Dreadnought, the Beast, the Star Destroyer, if you will. Just a very powerful unit, can also bombard planets. And then the War Sun, which is notable for two reasons. One, it is probably the worst gaming piece in the world to step on in your bare feet in the middle of the night. Secondly, it's basically the Death Star. It rolls three dice when it attacks. Now, uh, you can look at this card here. And let's see if we can focus up on this. And this card shows each of these pieces, and that's two sides. And you can see the cost. For example, ground unit costs one for two. And then it says battle eight. That means in battle, you need to roll an eight or higher to hit on a ten-sided die. Uh, while, for example, the war sun, it rolls three dice, and it needs three or higher to hit. Uh, the dreadnought costs five, and it it's five or higher to hit on those. So these are pretty powerful units or different units are more powerful than others, but they also have a cost that you need to tap your cards or pay trade goods to buy. And you're limited to the number of pieces that you have in the game, except for infantry units and fighters, for which the game provides tokens, and you can have basically as many of them as you want. There's some other restrictions to building units, but you can play the game to find those out. One of the things I really like about the game is the technology. Each player has a whole pile of technological cards. Now a few of these cards you will start to game with depending on your race. But as the game progresses you're going to want to build more of these technologies because well they give you advantages. Many of the technologies require and have different requirements that you need to play them. Now that can be kind of confusing but if you go on the internet you can find some really nice tech trees that will show you exactly what's needed to build what. Very useful. Something I think the game should have had. There's one in the rule book but it would have been nice to have them to pass around to different players. But these can do different things, like anti-mass deflectors, let you move through asteroid fields. The war sun technology, you actually need this to build war suns. You can't build war suns until you have this technology. Micro technology, when you get trade goods from your agreements, you get an extra trade good. Assault cannon. Your dreadnoughts can fire one shot before this, the battle begins. Um, well, now I'm showing you some of the uh, technologies from the expansions. Here you can draw an extra action card. You say, wait a minute extra action cards. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there is a huge deck of action cards that you will be drawing one from each turn, but you can get more of these action cards. And these action cards will let you do all sorts of things. You can play them different times. They'll give you advantages during battles. Uh, they can be played as an action on your turn. Here you can play if you have two trade agreements. Refresh up to two of your exhausted planets. Play anytime. 
Here you can choose a system which you just activated. Increase the movement of all ships there by one. Here you can destroy a damaged dreadnought. What's that I'm talking about? Oh yeah, dreadnoughts and, and warsons are cool because when they're hit in battle, you just turn them sideways. They take in one hit. It takes two hits to destroy them. Whew. You can see, ladies and gentlemen, that there's no way I'm going to be able to explain every possible feature of this game. It takes me about 30 minutes usually to explain it. I just want to go over some of the different parts of it to tell you how exciting it is and how the different things that are involved. But the techs are neat because they let you customize your race to what you want it to be. There is no possible way you will be able to build them all. In fact, you can't even build half of them. You're lucky to get eight or nine different technologies out there, so you have to sit there and decide which ones are most beneficial to you. I did not forget about the, polit the political card. It. We're back to it now. When the political card comes, the person who plays this card gets action cards. Yeah, there's another way to get action cards. But then what you're going to do is you're going to draw the top card of this political card deck. Now, the political card deck is made up of different laws, usually. And each law, for example, this law here says class struggle. Well, let's look at a, let's look at a, a different law here. Checks and balances. Here's a good law. When this law comes up, everyone is going to vote using as many planets as they want to for the influence and the most votes will cause either the law to pass or against it. For example here, when a player chooses a strategy card during the strategy phase, that's these, he must give the chosen card to another player rather than taking it himself. So if, if this law goes into pass, this comes into effect for the remainder of the game. These laws will change rules of the game. This is a big deal. So you say, well I'm not going to vote for that law. Well, if you vote against it, each player must immediately pass his current strategy card to the player on his left. What? But I mine gives me the free technology and I haven't even used it yet. Yeah, I know. So you need to think very carefully as to what you're going to do uh, with these laws. And there's a lot of back and forth negotiation when this political thing comes into, into play. And players will do uh, backstabbing and negotiation to get these laws into play. Sometimes it's not necessarily a law. Sometimes you pick a player and that player gets either a special benefit or a negative or sometimes you pick a planet and something happens on that planet. So there's lots of these political cards in the game. I mean a ton of them. You won't see most of them during the game but this is one of the cool things. The political phase. The game comes with several variants included with the game. One of these variants are leaders. So you can see here, here are the three Hassan leaders that are included with the game and you can utilize these leaders each leader has a certain kind like you have technology leaders and admirals and trading leaders and there's different types of leaders and they can be used in the game they can find a ship give it extra power they can be stationed on the planet you have better technology from that planet we use the leaders sometimes leaders can be captured executed you know they add some cool aspects to the game but you know I don't I don't know that they're de necessarily absolutely need it. You can, there's also other variants where you can fight each other. There's a really silly little variant that I love to play with even though it almost never comes in handy and that's if you're going up against a war sun there's a chance you can send your fighters on a trench run. I'm not sure what movie that comes from and they have like a 1 out of 50 chance of blowing it up but still hey come on that's still pretty cool. Um, but the biggest and probably most controversial variant is the distant suns and basically these are at the beginning of the game you put one of these on every planet and when you discover that planet, you flip it over and something will happen. If it's green, yay, something good happened to you. If it's red, something bad has happened to you. And they can give you technologies. They can give you, it can be a, a wormhole that you didn't know about. It can be troops that will fight you. It can be a radiation planet that destroys you, uh, all the troops that land on it. And I think that's a neat idea for exploration. The problem with these are is that they frankly are really diverse and if you have a bunch of good ones near you and a bunch of bad ones near someone else you have such a huge leg up on them. Now you can look at them, you can scan to see what they are but again that will really slow you down. Uh, they just don't add a lot to the game for me but some people really do like them and if you want a sense of exploration you can use this expansion. Finally each of the races in this game have special abilities. Uh, like for example these guys can use the diplomacy all the time. Uh, they're, they're kind of the turtles. I mean, they have a turtle looking shell. They're the guys who are hunkered down in the defense. The Lysak, they are the people, their dreadnoughts are cheaper than everyone else and more powerful. So these guys live off their dreadnoughts. Very aggressive race. 
the Nautilude Collective, they always get to go first, for example, and they can do some tactical retreating. Wimps. Uh, then we have the Federation of Soul, the humans, basically. And they can always put ground forces out on different planets eat more easily than everyone else. And they get an extra command counter, which really gives them a lot of ability to maneuver. And, well, they're the humans. Then the Sardak Noir, these guys have one special ability. They're plus one to all combat roles. Very powerful, very warlike race. The Barony of Letnev, these guys can have more ships than everyone else, and they can also spend trade goods to give their ships special abilities. The, the Osari tribes, don't you love the way I'm butchering all these names? These guys can skip their action turn, and they can also get, they get extra action cards that they can play. The Mentak Coalition, they, get an ex, they have bigger fleets too, and before a space battle, they can shoot their cruisers. These guys can use cruisers, cruisers more effectively than other players. The Universities of Jolnar, these are the tech guys. These get more free techs. They have a negative one to all their attack rolls for the game, but hopefully their techs will increase to such a point that that won't be a problem. Then we have the Emirates of Hassan, which I already told you, were the, the traders, uh, the people who like to trade goods to each other. So, again, I didn't go over every little detail of the game, but the game just has some neat aspects. Let's go to the conclusion. You can see at this point in time that Twilight Imperium is most certainly one of my favorite games. I love it. I want to play it all the time. It's just amazing. The problem is I can't play it all the time. It's almost an annual event for me, maybe biannual, because it just takes so long to play. And there's a, you know, there's a lot going in, too. When you teach a new player to play, it can take half an hour to an hour to explain everything that goes into it. That being said... I cannot fathom a space game being better than this one in a sense because there's just so much in it. There's so many ships, different kinds of ships. Each race has a very different feel with different starting planets, uh, different styles of play. Uh, the method of picking these strategy cards, this is, this is brilliant. Yes, it's kind of cobbled together from what other games have done, but it works really well. Because on my turn, the turns go very fast in a sense. Yes, the game is long, but you are involved all the time. Your turn comes, you say, okay, am I going to use this card, or am I going to do some tactical action on the board? Okay, I do that, your turn. Come back around. If someone plays one of these cards, you have to decide, am I going to do the secondary action right now? You're always watching what everyone does. There's back and forth. Conquest can be a big part of the game, but doesn't necessarily have to be. You can win the game without ever fighting another player, although as the expansions come by, that gets more difficult because they certainly are going to be more warlike as time goes by. Do you need the expansions? Maybe. Uh, I, I don't think you need them. Like, I, I loved the game before them, but now that I've played with both expansions, I can't imagine playing the game without them. But as it, as it stands, just as the game is right here, with all these pieces and all this stuff going on, it is an absolute great game. Uh, you will, it, it, some people, I mean, I, like I said, the biggest thing is the time, but other than that, the artwork is fantastic. The backstory is cool. Uh, the way everything plays together. Twilight Imperium, it's been out for quite a while now. Uh, this is the third edition, and I cannot see that they will make a fourth. Okay, what do I know? But this edition, I don't see how it can really be improved upon. It is the ultimate space epic game, and if you are looking for something like that, there is no reason why you should not own it. Thanks for joining us today. For more written, audio, and video reviews, as well as the number one board game podcast, check out the website at www.thedicetower.com. Until then, this is Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. Yeah. Yeah.